Hello, everyone. Uh, we still have some attendees joining in, but uh, we need to get moving. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining this webinar, The New Blue Revolution, The Future of Land-Based Salmon Farming. Uh, it is a fascinating topic, one of the hottest topics uh, that we certainly cover at Intrafish, uh, and it has gained more and more attention. Uh, there's so many issues. We have a fantastic panel, so I'm very, very excited to, uh, to get going today. Um, it's strange times. And uh, I think one of the uh, one of the unfortunate things is that an event like this uh, would be fantastic to have in person, uh, so that everyone could network and uh, and make connections. But the silver lining is that uh, that we're able to connect in a different way. And so we have uh, we have hundreds of attendees on the line uh, today, and uh, and it'll be um, it'll be a great way to connect more people. Uh, about this topic. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions out there. The audience is very diverse, uh, but as I said, we have a very skilled uh, panel. Uh, my name is Drew Cherry. I'm the editor-in-chief of Intrafish. For those of you that don't know us, uh, we're the world's largest seafood, aquaculture, and fisheries news and business intelligence provider. Uh, we've been doing that for uh, over 20 years, and we're based in the United States, the UK, Singapore, uh, in Chile, uh, and of course in Norway, where we're, we're headquartered and, uh, and where we are, are, were founded. And so salmon's been in our blood for a long, long time, um, but land-based salmon in particular has captured imaginations beyond just the seafood sector. Uh, it's gone broadly into the investment community, into the ag community. There is so much interest around this, so Again, we have a lot of topics to explore. First, I'd like to thank our co-hosts, Bill and Aquaculture. Uh, you will hear from them in just a moment. And our sponsor, OxyGuard, who also will be joining us on our panel uh, later. So very quickly, I wanna introduce our panelists. They'll be coming on uh, in just a moment uh, after uh, we hear from Bjarni Hald Olsen, who's the COO and Business Development Manager at Billen. So we'll have Eric Heim, he's the president of Nordic Aqua Farms Inc. We have Brian Vinci, the director of the Freshwater Institute of the Conservation Fund. Carl Emil Johannesson, he's an equity researcher with Pareto Securities. Uh, and we have Paul Allen Ting, who's Petrosen, who's the CEO of OxyGuard. So fantastic, uh, fantastic event. Excited to get moving. A little bit of house cleaning up in the right hand corner there of your uh, webinar software you're going to see that you have the opportunity to ask questions. And my colleague, Demi Corbin, is monitoring those questions and toward the end of the event, we'll be able to, uh, to field as many of those as we can. We've got plenty of questions here that we need to answer, but uh, we will try to get to some of those uh, at the end. So do feel free to ask some questions uh, of the panelists as we go along, as they come to you. Uh, and as I said, we'll, we'll see if we can get to it. Um, those of you that are uh, following things on social media, of course, uh, we have to have a hashtag, and that is IFM Land Based Salmon. So uh, feel free to follow along. We'll be live blogging from this. We have the uh, Interfish editorial team uh, keeping track of, uh, of what's happening and spreading that out to, uh, to the audience beyond who's, who's registered here. In addition, there'll be a recording of this uh, event, so you can always uh, forward that on to colleagues uh, and take a look at that uh, later uh, at another time if you want to review anything here. So with that, I'd like to have uh, Bjarne join us uh, from Bill and Aquaculture. He's going to set the stage a bit uh, for the discussion uh, with a presentation on, uh, on land-based uh, salmon. And, uh, and what we need to know and the state of the industry right now. So Bjarne, I'd like to ask you to join us, please, if you can turn on your camera and start your presentation. Yes, does, can you hear me, Drew? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, and can you see my screen also? Yep, you are uh, on and the audience can see you. Okay, thank you, Drew, and thanks for being able to join this uh, webinar. And um, hello, everyone. I was just going to say nice to see you, but I can't see anyone. So anyway, it's nice to at least know you are out there. My presentation will highlight some of the key factors to manage rascal route challenges. 
But first, I would like to give a short, small introduction to Bill on Agriculture and, and how we as a RAS supplier have seen or see the business we have been part of the, third, the last 36 years, uh, actually since the beginning of RAS. I can show it has been a journey and right now it's just exploding in a good way, you can see. Just some key data for Billon Aquaculture. Uh, we are more than 35 years of experience in the RAS. We have our main office in Denmark, and then we have daughter companies in Norway, Chile, USA, and Australia. We have more than 300 employees. I have to say that uh, we have our own installers as well, so that's why we are quite big in numbers. Uh, just also for you to understand that we are more than 22 nationalities, and that just shows how difficult it is to get staff that are educated within RAS. You have to go out of Denmark's borders, that's for sure. So far, after 36 years, we have built more than 30, 500 RAS in the 140 projects. We have experience in 25 countries around the world. And so far, we have built RAS for more than 30 different species. Tendency, I just show you some of the some pictures of the RAS we've been building. You see Lancet Sapphire in Miami, you see it in Chile, uh, south of Chile, you see Kingfish Sealand in Holland, you see um, Belswick in Tondheim in, for Leroy Seafood. And um, the tendency in the RAS business is bigger and bigger and bigger. In the old days, we thought that we felt that 500 gram biofilter capacity was huge. Nowadays, we are designing fish farms that have a daily feeding of more than 40 tons. Um, tank size wise, in old days, we saw that 200, 300 cubic of tanks volume, they were big. Nowadays, we are asked to design tanks, fish tanks that are up to 27 meter in diameter, equals a volume of 5,000 cubic or 5 million liter of water. So yeah, everything is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As I said, we have been working with 30 different fresh and seawater species, um, but today 95% of our turnover is related to the salmon industry. It started with uh, people asking for smolt systems, small grass, where you farm the fish from X to 80 to 100 gram. Later on, they, the same people more or less comes back and say, we want to do the post malt now, that could be from 80 to 100 gram and up to, yeah, even up to 2.6 kilogram uh, before they are entering the net cases in the sea. And the, the reason for this request, huge request for post malt is that they then have the less time in the net cases, it's actually down to only five, months before they are ready for slaughtering. And that means the pressure for diseases and sea lice, et cetera, are becoming much less and less treatment. So that makes sense. Having this journey going from freshwater uh, and smalt, we also now start to become more and more into the salt water RAS, uh, where you have to focus on other ways of doing the dimension of your RAS. This slides give you a picture of the journey Bilon have had the last 36 years. Uh, it all started with uh, eels back in 84 and the, uh, until more or less year 2000. Then at that time, around the year 2000, especially Chile, which is the second largest salmon producer in the world, they were requesting uh, small facilities. Um, and um, that quite became a big success actually. And just to, to say today, more or less 65% uh, of all small being raised in a RAS has been raised in a billion agriculture RAS. At the beginning, Norway was just sitting on the bench and seeing and following how was it going in Chile. And they, not, they did not really start up their request for salmon small RAS before around 2010. Uh, and then, this has been exploding since then and um, for the post malt also. And uh, now the tendencies, they are bigger and bigger post malt worldwide, but now also the, the request, why not just let the salmon be on land from egg to full size uh, for harvest. And that we started doing some experience with in the 2012. 
and uh, where we started up with Atlantis Sapphire in Denmark. And a little later on, 2014, also other species has been requested for, yeah, much, let's say salmon or and other species grow out. So let's say grow out is, you can say, starting to become mature. Um, I just show you with this uh, trip, this journey, we started off with eels for as a grow out. Then uh, we started with in 2006 to do it for sturgeon, beluga sturgeon, Russia sturgeon, uh, in Moldova, in uh, for, for for sturgeon yeah. Then in 2010 we started off with salmon grow out around 12, uh, 10, 000, uh, sorry, 1000 ton. 2014 we were requested for doing grow out for pike perch as well, 500 gram for salmon in Poland and China for trout. And lately we have done um, grow out for yellowtail kingfish and for kingfish sealand in Holland, for trout in Finland and uh, the big now Miami projects for Atlantic Sapphire in uh, yeah, Miami. So actually globally we have installed over 50%, 55% of all salmon grow out facility. I just want to highlight some of the key factors for RAS grow out, and um, which is a cocktail of, let's say, we know well proven RAS technology is in grow out is not guaranteed for success. It well proven technology in grow out is not enough in order to take for granted that the project will be successful. There are many parameters that have influence on this success. I will say it's a cocktail of these nine highlighted parameters, like you need a good production plan for your facility. The fish tanks are getting, becoming bigger and bigger. You need good tank hydraulic. You need very good water quality. In this respect, we are working with fixed bed filters to lower the suspended solids and have a good turbidity. You have a solution integration. That's a lot of support functions like a pH regulation of the RAS systems, feeding, fish feed distribution, staff, very, very important issue, uh, and which is in lack in the industry. More and more data collection, analysis, automatization, and robotization is something that we see in this business and will become bigger in the future. Focus, a lot of focus on logistic, fish handling and grading. Um, number eight, biosecurity. You have to have focus on the, your firewall to make sure you don't get any bacteria or virus into your RAS and also see from a human point of view that you do not carry anything on your boots, etc. And it's very important that you keep your RAS in stability. I just mentioned the, the water treatment before. So what is important is removal of the solvent, uh, nutrients, reduction of suspended solids, remove organic material and stable performance and, and biological balance. Um, talking about water quality and grow out, what we see not only with the salmon, but in general with bigger fish in wrasse on land, is that the, the bigger the fish, they, they become more sensitive regarding water quality, especially when it comes to CO2, suspended solar and turbidity. So we have very much focused on reducing the CO2 that can either be with a rated sums or by trickling filter with a rating. And the water quality we have focused on by having this fixed bed biological filters in our RAS. Again, managing, managing is the most important. And so actually, we, when we talk about these nine parameters, I will say most focus and most important is management to lead that will lead to success. The staff qualification, training and support, well, they need to know about and have to focus into the fish farming capabilities, scatter setup, sensors, control, alarm system, etc., automatization, biological support. So it's very important that all we in the business where we are doing the RAS uh, as a business, it's very important that we bring in the training education along with the execution of the projects. In building agriculture, we never make a contract without training education for minimum six months. 
you can put it in other way. We will never sell a car without the, the, the buyer of the car have a driving license to drive the car. Otherwise, you will never be successful. Salmon grow out, rasper salmon grow out, it's not just a shelf product. It takes time to learn. And the only way we can have success is that we have a permanent close relation between the rasp supplier and the salmon producer. The rasp supplier in general can take care of biological production plan, dimensioning, engineering, fish farming experience, project planning, project execution, and biological support. But the client therefore also has this, these topics, financing, site selection, permitting, dimensioning, design, project implementation, and fish farming in general. So it's a partnership. It's a kind of a marriage that goes on forever and will continuously exchange of knowledge. Very important. How do we see the salmon grow out future? Well, as also uh, was a report by, uh, by uh, Rapper Bank stated here in 2012, that there have been revealed more than 60 projects with a total production capacity of equal to 800,000 tons a year in 2030. In billion eyes, uh, then we will will guess that if we should uh, have a production prote protection, we will say around 200 to max 300 tons of Atlantic salmon in 2030. First of all, you need you need RAS producers to build these farms. Secondly, it do take two to three years to execute and to build the farm, have training, education, etc. And end of the day, there are not enough quality staff to manage these farms. So we are more, pes not pessimistic, but do not put the bar that high when it comes to our projections for 2030. How can the aquaculture industry achieve this goal in 10 years time, even if we're talking about 200 tons or 300,000 tons in yearly production? Well, we have to consider these seven parameters. And we, these are the site selection, of course, there need to be uh, key supply availabilities, for, uh, electricity, oxygen, etc. cetera. Uh, but also very important is fo focus points are genetic develop development that means strings and family selection in order to achieve better performance in the rash many of the ex producers nowadays they have more have focused on the, the power of performance of the fish in the net cages but this is in a rash and that's a total other environment so more focus from the genetics uh, for the ex suppliers in the strings for rats will is very very important when it comes to fish feed development it's the same Development of, of feed for RAS, less pollution that you also uh, pack in the excrements so you can take it away in the mechanical filters. These are topics that has been less focused on before, but now start to become an issue for the different fish feed producers uh, while the production of land base are increasing. So um, that's very, very important fish feed comp competition as well. Also fish feed logistic, the distribution of the fish, uh, sorry, of the fish feed, so they do not have broken pellets, etc. More and more, we see artificial intelligence going into the RAS as well. Uh, but again, staff qualification management is number one. So, by these focus parameters, I will say thank you from my side. Thanks for listening. Bye. Well, thank you, Bjarne. I appreciate that overview. I don't think there could be uh, any better outline for our discussion today. So uh, I'll ask the panelists to turn on their cameras and microphones, uh, including you, Bjarne, so that we can yeah. all get the discussion going proper. You should be able to see everyone's name. I did give a brief introduction so, uh, so you can see uh, who's who. And uh, Bjarne, I still can't see you on the camera, so I think you need to turn yours on. But uh, but you're not first up in the in the question anyway, so that's okay. There you are. Okay. Now you're joining. Okay. Thank you. So uh, okay, again, fantastic, uh, fantastic setup for our discussion today, and gentlemen, very excited to get moving. Um, Eric, first question goes to you. So 
the salmon farming industry has spent a lot of time, effort, energy into making production more sustainable. And meanwhile, we have uh, freshwater and land, two precious commodities that uh, that are increasingly going to be uh, difficult to um, to to find um, to find and, and use uh, uh, to get that um, to get that social license for. So tell us a bit, what's the case for land-based salmon broadly? Why focus our attention on this when we have conventional net pen salmon farming that is um, considered more and more sustainable? Uh, sure, uh, you mentioned uh, water and land as two issues. Um, I guess first of all, we can start with saying that whatever method being used, net pens or offshore land-based, you still need fresh water for your smolt phase. When you come into the grow phase, you have a choice. You can use fresh water, brackish, or seawater. Uh, seawater will basically be the same water as net pens use, uh, which is the case in our farms. We have seawater access in all our farms. So I would say that you know farms who are looking to use fresh water, uh, the port as the primary source, uh, sustainable uh, sourcing of that will be very important in your location search in those cases. So I think you know it really depends on the case and location and whatever. And I would argue that land-based farm can be equally efficient in freshwater use as any uh, net pen or other type of operation. So, um, and I think also, and what this really says is a lot about, um, you know, whether you're offshore net pen or land-based, um, all of them have strengths and uh, weaknesses compared to location. Some uh, areas, land-based can be a good solution and other areas not, and will be the same with net pens. So, as far as land is concerned, I think um, the perspective there is really land use. Um, if you go in the ocean, you use public waters. If you go to land, you use private property. Uh, and I think the real interesting context there is putting it in, in perspective of what kind of land uses do we have today? For example, USDA average uh, uh, cattle production per acre is 1.8 acres per cow. If you take one acre of our production, we produce approximately 700, uh, 700 tons a year per acre. So, <laughs> so you can put all this into perspective, I think, in the end. So uh, I think just to wrap that up, uh, I think uh, what really is important here is the opportunity to diversify the industry. So we have several legs to stand on. Uh, land base is working through its challenges. Uh, ocean farming is going to go through climate change with a lot of open questions related to that. Hedging our bet for the future is what this is about. Great. Brian, I want to talk to you just a little bit about uh, where we've been. I thought uh, Bjarni's uh, timeline was fantastic of when the, the grow out uh, requests really started booming. That said, uh, as you mentioned, it goes all the way back to eels, and you've been dealing with uh, with grass, grass projects for a long time. What do you think has changed since 2012? Uh, what is it that has uh, suddenly made grow out so compelling? Yeah, and, and Drew, um, just uh, thanks for the invitation to participate as part of the webinar, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on the webinar with this panel of, um, of esteemed colleagues. Uh, I thought the presentation was excellent, and especially that timeline, as you mentioned. Now, we put our first cohort of salmon um, into the RAS here in 2007. And, uh, you know, two years later, um, we had our first harvest in 2009. So we've been looking at the land-based um, RAS uh, feasibility since 2007. And over the course of the last 13 years, we have seen this tremendous uh, arc of change, as you mentioned. Um, initially, we saw a lot of impetus to um, move to RAS from environmental nonprofits who were essentially anti-net pen and wanted to have some sort of alternative that was feasible. And, and that's um, uh, an, an interesting uh, an interesting you know, approach to it. We are, are more of the approach that you can use the resources uh, sustainably efficient and still have a great economic benefit. So, so I think there are these different motivating factors. And, and Eric mentioned something about site selection 
and unique situations or specific situations, which I think is spot on, which is um, in the US, land base is probably the only way we're gonna have significant expansion of salmon aquaculture, right? So we have uh, warmer waters to the south and we have very limited uh, uh, area for net pens in the, on the sides of um, uh, the east and west coast towards the north. And even those, as Eric mentioned, are, are gonna be affected by climate change. So for us, I think in the US, um, this is an alternative that isn't necessarily anti-net pen, but it's a way to expand. And it's also a, a national food security uh, issue for, for us. You know, we import, you know, depending on the statistics, some 90% of seafood into the US and in terms of salmon, it's essentially almost everything. And, uh, you know, we need to get away from that. We need to be more self-sufficient uh, as a country, uh, producing salmon that we think is, you know, a great protein with heart healthy benefits and that can be done sustainably. So, you know, there, there are, like I said, an arc of change, Drew, that goes from uh, when we started and the different motivating factors that push this along. Of course, one important factor is the, the move to post smolt. And, and Bjarne had worked so many years in Chile, and his team worked so many years in Chile doing the post smolts. Mm. Um, and that also showed the technical and biological feasibility that is fundamental for land based grow up. Exactly. Great. And, you know, I think that that, uh, that uh, um, topic of people coming into the sector. In particular, we've seen so many investors that have jumped in, so many different projects. Uh, great anecdote that I love is my colleague, Anders Faruset. Uh, when we've been covering land-based salmon, he said, well, some of these projects are just a guy in a cell phone. Uh, and when you look at some of these, uh, some of these projections, Bjarne, I think you were a lot more conservative uh, than some other projections for 2030. Yeah. So I, I think it's wise for everybody to um, to maybe um, to recognize that some of these projects are financed, uh, some of them are not. So Bjarne, I love the uh, I love the statement you said about the car and the driver's license. So tell us a bit about that. How then should investors? Uh, how should they look at some of these projects? How should they evaluate them? How do you evaluate them when these projects come to you uh, and, uh, and, yeah. and folks say, hey, we want to build a land-based salmon farm uh, here and we're going to go out and, and uh, get hundreds of millions of dollars to finance it? How do you determine what's, uh, what's real? Yeah, it's a very good question, Drew. First of all, we have many, many, every week there are people calling and say, hello, we would like to buy a fish farm. Uh, what do you suggest? What species do you suggest, etc." And uh, because uh, land-based farming, it is sexy by all means. But again, what we do is we try to take it from a biological point of view. Uh, they they need to be a bit educated in the biology as well. We are talking about live animal here, live fish. Uh, it's easy to sit with an Excel sheet and uh, and predict uh, production, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so what we do is, the, first of all, we have to find out whether uh, how serious is this client. Secondly, we have a, a, we take a couple of days to actually introduce what is this kind of rash uh, and, and what do we have to focus on here, and uh, helping with production plans and showing also what what happens if you derivate from from what you have planned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so it is from the beginning quite some ex, uh, education uh, to find out where are this investor are they do they really know that it takes more or less three four years before you are up selling the products um, yeah I yeah and helps. I think yeah and I think it's interesting that we've seen um, we've seen private financing um, like Eric's project. And then suddenly we've seen some, some major uh, publicly listed companies jump in. We've seen Nippon Susan Kaisha from Japan. Exactly. We've seen Dong Wan from South Korea. So it certainly caught the attention, um, not to mention the uh, the stock listing of Atlantic Sapphire and, and uh, Onfjord and um, uh, potentially others. So Carl Immel, um, tell us a bit about how you see uh, this production, how it factors into your uh, analysis of the potential for these companies, but also how it affects your outlook for the general uh, salmon uh, production in the coming years, just overall. 
I think uh, the lambda salmon farming industry is, is definitely here to stay. Uh, we see more and more projects getting the financing, even though there are still quite a few. I can almost kind of count them on, on one hand, the amount of projects that actually has raised sufficient money to, to build a, a really large facility. And by that, I say like several thousand tons uh, is a large facility. Uh, and this will be a gradual process because, as uh, Bjarne says, it takes four to five years from you have a plan uh, and maybe even longer when you need to get all the grants, etc., to, to start building. So, uh, in my kind of models, the next few years, uh, this will not have an impact on, on the global supply balance. Uh, but when we talk 2030, uh, I definitely think part of the, the supply uh, globally uh, will, will come uh, from land. Um, it will not be a million tons as you can kind of calculate when you add all the different projects uh, in total. Uh, and it, of course, it depends a lot on how successful the first projects will be, uh, but that it can be uh, hundreds to 200,000 tons it is, is definitely uh, possible. Uh, and then it will have a meaningful impact, but still it will be a niche. Uh, I think it will take a very long time, if ever, uh, before we see kind of land is being bigger than, than uh, ocean based and uh, that fence. Uh, but it will, it will be some kind of competition, but it will also be something that uh, that will add probably new consumers to the to the salmon uh, farming or other species and, and, and will increase consumption. Uh, mm -hmm. But at some point, it, it will be something that can kind of uh, increase the supply growth and, and lead to a more balanced market than we have seen in the salmon market the last couple of years, where we actually have had too little supply growth and the prices have gone very, very high, especially in, in some periods. Oh God, come on. So, so um, Carly, I'm going to tell us a, a bit about uh, the valuations of Atlantic Sapphire and what's happened with uh, Onshore since they've listed on the Oslo Mercure market. Uh, what do you make of the valuations of these companies that have, as you said, raised not a whole lot of fish? Um, that that seems to be um, that seems to be out of whack with uh, with what other salmon farmers are able to uh, to do with their earnings. Yeah, I think uh, it has a lot to do uh, with the, the fact that uh, land-based farming is a very new industry and there are very few people out there that, that know really how to do this. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, companies that have uh, kind of the people that, uh, that uh, have been doing land-based farming for a while and have the skills to, to kind of execute on their plans. And, and then I think investors, they bet that some companies uh, will succeed and they can grow big because they will then have access to capital uh, easier than, than other companies that are not really started yet. Uh, and if those companies then eventually start to grow big, then kind of the market cap you see today is not necessarily a very high valuation uh, based on, on plans that seems more and more likely uh, where some, some years uh, don't grow. And then of course there is also uh, supply demand of, of available investment opportunities. Uh, there are not that many listed land-based companies at the moment. There are only two, uh, which are a very different ones. So if you're an investor and you don't have enough capital to kind of lift the whole project, then you, your only option is to, to buy shares in one of those listed companies. And so it's kind of a way for them to get exposure to, to a market that uh, uh, could be a really big uh, some years on the road. Right to to let people uh, have that first mover uh, advantage, I guess, is their uh, is their um, their play on that. So, um, Eric, that's uh, it's an interesting approach to go on the public markets to raise uh, money um, that comes with uh, quarter to quarter risk. Correct. So, if you have a uh, a die off, uh, Atlantic Sapphire had an emergency harvest uh, just this summer. Um, you know, the investors can get uh, awful shy, uh, awful quickly. So is public listing, is that the best way to move forward with these projects? Or do you really need to look for the backing of patient long term uh, private financing? What's your view? I would say, you know, it comes down to a choice. Uh, like you're saying, uh, we are we remain a privately uh, held company. Um, and have basically uh, took, taken the position that uh, we want to mature the company uh, and then at the right time consider a public listing. So I think uh, there's a learning curve involved in all these projects and having, you might say, the peace and calm to walk through that learning curve uh, has some value. 
Um, that's essentially what we've done. Um, I, I think, you know, if you have die-offs and things like that, you're still required to report them. So eventually they, they will be known uh, to the market. But still, yes, you are subject to a lot of reporting, a lot of extra requirements that can be a burden for companies in the development phase. So I think it comes down to making the right choice of when to do it. Um, and of course, when you see big companies trying to go direct uh, to market, uh, like we have seen some of, and with significant capital needs, um, sometimes that may be the right choice. Um, other companies choose to wait. We have chosen to wait. Carl Emil, um, tell us, you know, obviously, and we'll get to this a little bit later uh, when we talk about uh, Smolt and the trend towards larger size Smolt, uh, because um, most major salmon farmers, uh, conventional salmon farmers, it's not that big of a step for them to take uh, the, the move to go to full grow out uh, market size salmon. Why haven't more companies taken that step? Even in small levels, we recently saw uh, Kvaroy, uh, a small family-owned salmon farmer, uh, initiate its interest in a land-based project. But why, in your view, haven't more salmon farming companies um, at least dip their, their foot into, uh, into land-based grow-out production? I think firstly, I think they feel that with increasing the size of the small, they are kind of gradually uh, moving uh, and, and learning on how to, to produce uh, full-grown salmon on land. Uh, but then I think they have uh, a really strong belief that the production in the sea will be the most cost-efficient cost and, and most profitable way also in the future. Uh, so they invest in post malt and, and in small facilities, uh, but they know that they can use them to produce salmon in the sea. And if they're in some years from now, there will be more licenses available and then there will be solved many of the biological issues you have today. Then you can use these post small facilities to, to produce smaller small, but then produce more fish in the sea. So I think that's kind of mentality and that thinking is something that lead them to, to not invest in kind of full grown facilities outside the, the traditional salmon farming industry areas. Because if you build a facility in Miami, for example, you need to produce uh, on land. You cannot use that for, for small production. Uh, so I think that they still believe that production in the sea would be the most profitable uh, in the future. Well, I can see, you know, I think in 2019, uh, when you look at movies, uh, Ebit per kilo, I think it was uh, 1 euro 65. So uh, that is uh, a lot more profitable than zero or negative correct so uh so bjarne um tell us though are you getting major salmon farmers knocking on your door asking about grow out and uh saying hey why don't we uh expand this uh this small facility and take it to full grow out are are, are they interested or is this uh, really about um up and coming uh you know uh, new startup projects mm. well as Carl also mentioned before, they have had and have still a lot of focus on postmol, and by that they are learning by doing because the postmol are getting bigger and bigger. Now we are reaching more or less three kilo for some of them. There's not that much left then. Secondly, uh, I, I, they are curious, very curious, and I, uh, down the road I do believe that all the established salmon farmers will also have salmon grow out as an, an niche. May, uh, and where they can say, listen, we do know how to grow salmon in rasp. We still believe in the net cages, but we have both products because as I also hear in many places now that the people, there are some people that are asking for uh, salmon grown in RAS. So asking for labeling of this so that the, that the established salmon producer, they have both, both products. Let me say it that way. But as I said, I, I do believe it will always be a niche uh, where it will be land-based grow out close to the rich cities, uh, close to the market. But there will still be the traditional, absolutely. So uh, Brian, yeah. Yeah. Brian um, tell us a bit, I mean, you, you know, the, the expansion of interest. Um, RAS has gone in some ways to, you know, a, not too long ago, it was, it was a hobby for, uh, for, um, uh, for a lot of people. It certainly wasn't considered a major commercial, uh, commercial uh, segment. So um, tell us a bit, what, is it, what does it tell you that there is all this uh, interest coming in? Um, do you think it's warranted? Do you think it's a little bit 
uh, too enthusiastic uh, too quickly? Um, thanks. Let me just uh, back up a little bit. I wanted to um, agree with uh, Carl Emil on the uh, <clears throat> and Bjorn on the um, major salmon players uh, holding off and learning uh, using uh, smolt and post smolt wrasse. Uh, we are involved in Control Aqua, which is a consortium uh, of uh, salmon growers in Norway and research uh, or institutes in Norway and uh, led by Nofema and University of Bergen and so on. And, and what we find, uh, because there's uh, you know, a lot of interplay with uh, salmon growers, is they are still very interested in, in working the wrinkles out of the post smolt. Um, there are some things they're seeing, uh, but in general, uh, you know, if you can do very efficient on land and then be extremely efficient cost-wise uh, for the grow out in the pens, that does appear to be a model that um, that we see through that um, through that organization is is uh, working. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's important. And you know, there are still some things in, on the post molt side to be worked out. And we're seeing, um, as a research group, you know, we're seeing um, the growers come through control aqua worried about things like uh, maturation stealth maturation essentially triggered fish um, on land that when they grow out can mature and become a detriment um, in terms of uh you know what is it too early or why all the in interest now you know I, i've been talking i talk with investors or investment groups uh, routinely um, they want to know about the sector and recently i've been asking why are you interested now like what 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 is it now that has changed versus 10 years ago? I mean, we were, honestly, we were growing salmon in RAS 10 years ago, producing 20 tons, you know, on a semi, it's very small basis. But, um, and what I'm hearing from the investors and the investment groups is uh, something that surprised me. Um, they are looking to sustainability and, and specifically they mentioned this ESG, the environmental, so social and corporate governance um, measure of of what they're investing in and they feel like you know they they've heard about RAS you know all of its great benefits and um, how efficient it can be but also how sustainable it can be and how you can locate uh, facilities closer to market reduce food miles and carbon footprint and uh, they're very interested in that and then some of the other Im impacts um, some of the other things besides that ESG is they're seeing um, a more macro level uh, interest in people wanting to reduce climate change, address climate change, and, and they're living a healthier lifestyle and worrying more about what they're, you know, they're eating. And they mm -hmm. see this as a healthy protein with very good attributes. So, so I was surprised to hear that from the investors, you know, who are looking at this, this is why, in my opinion, in terms of, is it too early to answer your question directly? I, I do not think it's too early. I think the technology is there. But if everyone on the webinar paid close attention to Bjarna's slide of nine, I think it was nine things, that's a key. Because I, I really don't feel like technology RAS technology is going to change all too much. I and mean, we're gonna work around the we're gonna work around the edges on some things, right? But it's how you put these things together, right? Both on a system basis in terms of um, designing to the right uh, production plan, but also all of those things that he mentioned, you know, the um, beyond the water quality, the genetics, the um, training, the operations knowledge. Uh, the very last one I think was stability. So I, I don't think it's too early. Um, I think we have the pieces, but not everyone's putting the pieces together correctly. So exactly. <laughs> I think it's a good way to describe it. Uh, Carl Emil, when, when you're doing your productions on land-based uh, salmon grow out and the volumes, um, you you have to factor in a certain level of uh, a failure. You have to have sort of an estimated failure rate. What is yours, and what do you feel about these uh, projection numbers? What are what are you actually seeing as a realistic uh, level of production in the coming years? I mean, first of all, many projects will never be built. So I think uh, a lot of them that you see uh, on some lists or that uh, you, you write, read an article about will probably never be built because they will not be able to raise the, the capital needed. It's it's very capital intensive to, to produce salmon on land. Uh, in terms of how much volumes will come from those facilities that will be built, it's, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, of course, in the beginning, uh, I think many plants will be 
pushed out in time and that there will be setbacks for, for all the companies. And uh, I guess uh, Eric can, can tell us everything about how, how things are getting delayed from, from time to time and beyond also we have several stories there. Um, so we definitely discount uh, the volumes that, that we kind of see in the plants and also for the companies that uh, are closer to production, uh, you, you kind of need to, to add some kind of uh, uh, likelihood that there will be, be delays. But, but it's very difficult to, to give exact uh, number on, on, let's say, whether it's 50-50 or it's 90-10, but 90% certainly that it will uh, be successful. Uh, but definitely there will be setbacks and many will, will probably never be built either. So let's talk about that social license that, that uh, I mentioned earlier, Eric, and um, you, you've shown a great photo, uh, or you showed it to me on your phone, of a U-Haul trailer that held all the permits that you needed for the main project. Um, and it was pretty impressive. And uh, I know that Nordic has gone through a lot of work to uh, get the permits necessary, but let's talk about what uh what what is a sweet spot that you need to uh to to look at when you're choosing a location why did you look at maine why did you look at california did it have more to do with the uh with the environment itself uh or was it about this uh social license knowing you were going to get government support knowing that you would have private uh uh, private landowners uh, able to come on board. Tell us, walk us through that a bit. Well, I think first of all, uh, finding good sites at scale um, with resources available on uh, nearby site is not easy for these projects. Uh, we search both coastlines. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in the end, uh, in our case, our whole model is built upon seawater access. So we also need a site nearby the ocean. Uh, and it needs to be clean water, which is not always a given. Uh, and it needs to be fairly cold water, which is not a given either many places, right? Like uh, Brian was saying. And, and then you need a constructible site. Uh, you need, uh, and one of the things I always emphasize is the importance of recruitment and retention of highly competent people. And for that to happen, you should be in a good uh, location with proximity to nice communities and so on where people want to stay. Uh, and that's often easy to forget how important that is because it is a competition for, kind of for talent in this industry. Um, but it, when it comes down to it, our, our strategy is being close to large consumer markets and Maine has, in, mm. in our first project in the US, does have a very strong seafood heritage uh, that's natural to build on. It's close to big markets in this region and then the same line of thinking really in california as well um finding really good constructible sites nearby the ocean with all these resources available is not easy so um so all of these three things really come together and a social license yes having you know this is kind of new in the us so the importance of dialogue with authorities uh, and and so creating understanding what this is and is not uh, there is a lot of confusion regarding production methods and what they mean and what they entail. So I think that whole process uh, from the political level down to the local level is really important. And then, of course, every location is different. And we see that across our projects. We have very different dynamics across our projects in terms of how states or communities sort of engage with these projects and how they perceive them. Yeah, and I think, uh, Bjarni, I'll, I'll go to you on that same question because uh, the U.S. suddenly is is kind of uh, ground zero for uh, land-based salmon production. Um, so the benefits of, uh, of a RAS system uh, are that you can build them really where you where you want, in theory. Um, but, um, but, you know, again, going back to Eric's U-Haul full of papers, um, then we look at areas like Japan, we look at areas like Africa, we look at areas like China. Um, what can we expect from some of these other regions? Do you see, are they prepped uh, to, to show the same kind of growth, uh, the same kind of potential that the, the US market has? So maybe start a bit with some of the other regions that you see as holding promise or that you have a lot of people knocking on your door about. Yeah, where we see requests for RAS 
all over the world. Absolutely, Eric, as you mentioned also that the, the US, of course, but again, many, we are talking about 12 projects I know about in China, Japan is coming as well, South Africa, uh, it's literally all over, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, Oman, all over. Uh, but as Eric also mentioned earlier, that it, it's not so easy to find the right location. It's, uh, it sounds easy just to get a, a location and then you need water and then you need electricity and so on. But it's not all over. You have good water quality, even for a rash, you, you're using a, a low amount of water in a rash. So in theory, you can uh, treat the incoming water to the quality you want. But at the end of the day, it, it increases your uh, capex and opex. So the, um, the requests are all over, as I said, all over the world. Uh, but it's not so easy, and I repeat myself again, to find the right locations. And some of the locations you find can be extremely remote. And then we have the problem also, you mentioned, Eric, who, else, who the hell do want to work there? Because it's out of, it's nobody. Yeah. So that's a challenge, that's a challenge. <laughs> but there are many serious uh, players all over. Yeah, and I think some of these uh, some of these systems uh, are sort of advertised as plug and play, Bjarna. And yeah. um, we're going to talk about the technical aspect in just a moment and bring uh, bring Pa on as well to talk about this. But um, that's not really the case uh, necessarily. There are small little tweaks that are made uh, all along the way. And while I sense that the uh, land-based salmon community as of now is very open with sharing information, and uh, Brian, certainly I know that, that you play a role there as well, um, but, but some of those things will be, can, begin, to, uh, begin to be uh, advantages. They'll begin to be, uh, they'll begin to be little points of differentiation that may impact size, color, taste, Another thing we're going to get to in a minute, um, but but Brian, tell us how um, how complex does it get beyond just if Billen comes and says we're going to build you this operation? That's not really the end, is it? That's kind of the beginning in a lot of ways for a producer to start to tweak their systems. Uh, yeah, Drew, that's a really good question <laughs> and a very good comment about. The tweaks that are, are are going to be happening. In fact, Eric, um, you know, he's he has his, essentially his own design firm in house. Correct, Eric? Your, your designer, yeah, sorry. Yeah. The design department, Denmark. Yeah. So, and and I think you just promoted somebody the other day. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so, and it's interesting. You know, one of our, uh, you know, one of our babies or one of our projects is Superior Fresh. And Superior Fresh is, you know, the first RAS company in the U.S. to to put fish into the market a couple of years ago, and they started out uh, with 50 tons and about three acres of uh, greenhouse. Now they're up to uh, the expansions, 500 tons and eight acres of greenhouse. And and um, Steve Sommerfeld, who was here for you know the better part of 25 years, has now gone to work with them. And and by by pulling Steve over to the project, they are starting to to put in their tweaks and those things that um, will differentiate them in terms of how they're decoupling the RAS and the aquaponics and how they're being very efficient. Um, and it's, I see some, you know, some of the things that Steve and I used to talk about were, you know, very open are not so open anymore. You know, he's, <laughs> he has to keep that innovation uh, with the company. And I think your comment is spot on about that, that you are gonna see these things as Eric has his own design firm, um, there are things in his design which honestly I don't understand yet, but <laughs> but but are unique and, and they represent intellectual property and um, uh, trade knowledge uh, that will potentially provide an edge over other companies. And so, um, Bjarne knows his system is better than anybody. Um, but it, it is true that once somebody gets the system after the supplier leaves, um, you know they're they're creating that operational know-how, which is essentially intellectual property uh, mm -hmm. by a different name. That's how they operate to create the efficiencies to get the best growth, have the best water quality, to have the best product, um, manage your water quality, to not have off flavor, all of those things. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a process. And, and I think it it's a process for all the growers out there. And it is going to become, it's early days now, but it, you know, in five, 10 years, 2030, I guess, 
there will be these uh, these twists and tweaks which create the efficiencies that distinguish the companies. So yeah. Eric, you talked about that competition for uh, for staff, and and I think and, and you mentioned it as well, Bjarna. But that to me is is something that I hear time and time again that mm. uh, Denmark has has become a, you know a, a one of the the headquarters for producing experts on this uh, on this sector. Um, but it's not going to be easy. There's precious few uh, people that really understand it fully in depth. Um, I'm not saying they're getting older, Eric. I'm not making a comment on your age, but we do need to uh, to find that new uh, that new breed uh, of workers. So, um, Eric, tell me a little bit. Do, where do where does the industry go out and find them? And is there an opportunity for land based salmon farming? To possibly attract the the kinds of uh, of young workers uh, into the sector that have been so challenging to to bring in. I think first of all, it's important to realize that an operation at scale involves a lot of different types of expertise. Um, so it's not just fish farmers, right? Uh, there's a lot of planning, development expertise, commercial expertise, market expertise. So you can pull from many different types of practice areas when you're putting together an, an operation like this. In our experience, from you know development over a few years, you need those interdisciplinary teams to really do a good job with these projects. Uh, it's not just engineers, not just fish people. It's a whole uh, stack of different competencies that need to work closely together to to arrive at a seamless result. So as far as fish, you know, the fish segment goes, Norway obviously has a big advantage uh, you know, as a market. There's a large industry there that has relevant competence. What we, what we have been doing in the US, we have been uh, successfully finding uh, people with good experience, but there's not many of them. Uh, I think the other thing we have also emphasized is co-location with universities and academic institutions that do have aquaculture and relevant types of study areas of study where you can look at workforce development efforts. So if you have a core of experienced people, you have the foundation to train uh, the younger generation and, and bring them in on board and create the next generation of leaders for this industry. Okay. So that's the challenge every company needs to position themselves for and work through as yeah. they build these kind of operations. Okay, I want to push you a little bit more on that because it goes back to what Brian talked about on uh, on proprietary technology. So we've mm -hmm. already seen both in the equipment side uh, and on the grow out side, we've seen some really seasoned execs moving from one project to the next project. Um, does that concern you, Eric? When you when you have a project, you work so hard, you get it uh, exactly the way you want it. Mm -hmm you lose a staffer over to a rival project. Is that a concern? I think, you know, movement of people is sort of uh, a given in any industry, huh? Mm. So and so then I think in the end, you know, that's why it's important to build, uh, you, you might say, within your team. So that, you know, if you lose one person, that's not gonna, that's not the end of the world. Um, uh, and I guess, you know, I, we've been lucky to be able to build teams in three countries at this time. And that certainly is very helpful in bringing that different expertise together. But yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to also making sure that you have really good employment uh, philosophy in the company and mm. that people want to stay in your company and develop in your company. So, so that really matters. But in the end, yes, you will lose people at some point. It's like that in any industry. <laughs> but one person, not, uh, my point is also that one person is just one piece of a puzzle. These are, you know, these are large projects with many, many disciplines coming together. So if one person will not pull off a project like this, it's teams that do this. And that's the point. Second. So I want to move into the technical aspect a bit now uh, and bring, uh, bring your expertise in, Pa. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we hear the most about, the most concerns about uh, from buyers, um are off flavors and i know it's something that there's been a lot of work going on on but it, it still remains an issue um there's some projects that have solved it some projects that haven't solved it um and ultimately while the technology can be brilliant and perfect um somebody's got to eat this and you're going to have to convince a, a major buyer or you're going to have to convince 
the person on the on the street in in Norway or the UK or the United States, wherever, um, that this is product that's that's worth purchasing. So I, I want to hear a little bit about some of the advances, Pa, that are being made in uh, in solving the off flavor issues uh, and what your experience is in terms of how close the broader sector is to, to solving them. Yes, uh, I think we are closer. We're definitely more closer than we were five years ago, you can say. There have been uh, a lot of concern about this issue over the years. And uh, I think ozone is one of the answers or part of the answer. It will probably not be the whole answer because there also be some about the te technical stuff around it. But uh, ozone would definitely be the one that brings the salmon on land. Uh, and everybody who is on land base right now to figure out they work in some way with ozone because they know this is will be the will be one of the keystones to solve it you can say uh, for our company ourselves we have been using three years now to just developing a ozone sensor because you have to like with the oxygen the generators have to be able to control them so you can control the exact amount just to avoid you don't get the bromide problem that also will give you off flavor problems, you can say. So the industry is close and uh, some have solved it. Some maybe have, have not got the problem yet, but uh, we are very, very close to it. And a lot of companies, we involve a lot of those who build all the big systems uh, or the grow out and they all try in different ways to assure that they, they solve this problem. It's a big issue. Bjarne, uh, what's your view on this? Uh, is, the, is the industry closer to solving it? And is it, a, is it a, an issue that needs to be solved one-on-one? -on -one? Is this another proprietary issue that companies themselves need to figure out? Or is it, does this fall on uh, Billund? Uh, when those fish come out on the other side, are they going to come back and say, hey, you sold me this, uh, this hundreds of millions of yeah. dollar system and my fish don't taste good. Um, how exactly. close are we uh, to solving the issue? We are definitely getting closer. And as uh, Power said, it's a, you can add in some techni technique to remove the off flavor, but still we have to remember that off flavor are many substances, scales, many nutrition, especially, and it comes from bacteria, it comes from algae. Uh, end of the day, you can buy also by the way you are drifting your biological filter. It's also a matter of organic material in the water, etc. So by management, you can also lower the off flavor issue and you can make it disappear. But end of the day, I did not dare to build a RAS grow out without off flavoring tanks because one day shit happens and then you have the off flavor. So it is a matter of building in routines where you are testing your products because end of the day, a RAS for salmon grow out as an example, you can, uh, you can, uh, let's say, uh, customize your product, right? Uh, fat content, muscles, you can exercise in the fish tank, you can, uh, how, what feed you give it, you, you can, it can be more uh, fatty acid or less, blah, blah. You can do everything, but yeah, if, it, if it's not tasting good, then you have a problem because, but I think we will be there in the, in the coming years, uh, but we can live with it. The problem is when you off flavor, you, they are, you have to go for at least five or seven days in, cooler water without feed that means they are losing weight and um, and that's irritating of course and um, and also cost uh, money of course because you're losing uh, this production and also you use more water in that respect because you have to purge what we do while we have the issue with purging and you have to do it by all means you have to use some water in your ras so taking the raw water you have to exchange in your ras anyway and put it in the purge tanks and then literally afterwards into the ras that at least help your consumption of water so brian um, the freshwater institute has done some work on this and recently some uh studies have have uh have gone out i think it's uh dr richardson if i remember that's been uh, doing some work on this, I believe. Um, I can't remember, but uh, but tell us a little bit about the uh, about the results of that, about the purging, about some of the weight loss. Um, what what um, what's your take on on where we are on this topic? Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I uh, we feel not just I, but we we feel that um, off flavor is something that is controlled right now. The the techniques to make sure that your product goes out the door without 
off flavor is known. It's it's not an unknown. It, um, for us, it's a, a six day uh, purge um, and the fish come out and uh, of course we research this, but they, they uh, taste great and it's a great product. Uh, there is essentially no tolerance for an off flavor product uh, from the buyers uh, or the wholesalers or retailers. So people have intimated that, well, if you're, or you're purging, you must be charging more for your fish. And it's like, no, no, that's not how it works. Um, <laughs> The product has to meet a certain level, and that means essentially no off flavor. So I, I think that we have techniques to do it, um, and those techniques have some downsides. And Bjarna <laughs> mentioned really one of the biggest, which is it takes water. And we have uh, recently completed work on uh, identifying a okay. optimal purging time or essentially water use uh, amount for that. That was uh, take a uh, study done um, at our place led by uh, john davidson who's i think you're um, you're referring to and, davidson, and john is, yeah. yeah john has kind of uh, led our effort there and he's soon to be dr davidson um and uh, so we've essentially in our last study we identified that um, you could purge three days at, at our location after the fish were spiked with off flavor mm -hmm. and uh, and be okay it is somewhat site specific because some sites do not have off flavor in their source water and then they don't generate, uh, the biofilter doesn't generate the off flavor. In some sites it's the reverse, they have lots of off flavors. So there is some site specific to it. Now we were interested in, of course, um, that reducing that water use uh, as a negative, but also reducing the lost income that's possible. Bjarna mentioned that fish lose weight. So we wanted to, specific for RAS fish, uh, Travis May, our production manager, um, was able to hold back um, a few hundred eight kilo fish, seven and eight kilo fish from the last grow out. And we ran some uh, studies on their uh, weight loss uh, during purge. And of course, if you can purge a short amount of time, you only lose about 2%. And based on today's uh, or the recent NASDAQ uh, salmon index pricing, that's you know only a $1.5 million on a 10,000 ton farm. But, um, if you have to hold the fish longer, and we, we do have folks in the U.S. who hold the fish up to 14 days in, in off flavor purge, um, they are losing up to 4% of their body weight. So that's a significant hit. Um, so there's those two things, the water use and the lost weight causing a revenue loss um, that uh, we think are things that we can improve upon. I, like I said, I do think the situation is People know how to get rid of it. Eric, in, in his case, I think he manages water quality and, and monitors it, and, and he has um, a very good handle on that. Uh, but um, if we can come up with techniques to essentially eliminate that uh, risk, uh, then we're working on that. And some of the things we're, we're looking at, Drew, are uh, finishing feeds, feeds that for whatever reason uh, allow the fish to um, push the off flavor out of their flesh. So we're gonna be looking at things like that. Um, uh, all other techniques that might uh, adsorb the off flavor from the from the tank that you want to harvest. So you do that for a couple of weeks at the end of a cycle. Um, there are also some biofilters that uh, that essentially eat uh, off flavor compounds that might be in jasmine uh, that could be integrated into the system. So there are some technologies out there still to be had. Great, Paul. Tell us a bit about uh, about water quality. I mean, one of the things that is uh, sometimes a bit shocking is how quickly losses can happen in these systems when something goes wrong. Uh, if it's uh, an oxygen issue or uh, or other factors that have, that can cause die-offs, um, what are sort of the the main uh, potential major kind of disaster risks, and how uh, can companies mitigate those? Uh, yes, uh, often I get the question from the farmers how important it is to have the monitoring system on the system or they're just going to uh, just keep with one probe uh, <laughs> down there. But in fact, I always uh, tell them that the, what is the most important, stop feeding them, stop giving them oxygen and you'll find out the problem. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and in fact, uh, you can say we had some... Uh, things where we say okay it's also something about the uh, because monitoring system also have a cost you can say but uh, if you consider a RAS system uh, like a car uh, this is your navigation system this is telling you how fast you're driving and telling you a lot of information about it uh, so you always have to look at your your farm and look at 
uh, what is the cost of the tanks I have? Can I can I can I take the stroke if I I lose one tank? You can say, and then you know what the monitoring system can be put in. You can say, one of the tendencies we see is that right now people start to put in more and more sensors for everything. The most impossible thing they ask us if you can't measure this and that. You can say. And uh, we, in fact, even if I speak against my own business, say, no, no, we should not put a lot of sensors in. You should, uh, the tendency we are going is that we want to have a few very important sensors like the oxygen, the TGP, and some other sensors in the tank. And then we have a uh, mechanical learn, uh, uh, AI, uh, machine learning or in, the, in the software that in fact, from those parameters can start to to help the farmer so you don't have too many sensors in because sensors also need maintenance. Maintenance point back to people. And then you, you can have so many sensors into the system, but if nobody maintain it, you are you have problems anyway. So so yes, uh, is there are a few ones that are very, very important, like the oxygen in the tank, because else the fish will start swimming on the back and nobody likes that. Uh, yeah. That that oxygen is is pretty important, I think. So, but uh, but how is that how is that technology evolving? Then, um, I mean, some of these some of these companies are, are have been very well capitalized, have a lot of experts, and yet the losses have happened nonetheless, and they've happened very quickly. So, how is that technology advancing right now so that uh, people can monitor these things real time? I mean, one would expect that in this day and age that technology is very advanced and that you should be able to pull up on your cell phone and find out what those oxygen levels are. Are we there yet? Yes, the systems are there, you can say, but there's also a balance. You can say when you, some of the laws have been because you have uh, nitrogen in the water. You can say that's just because you didn't have a probe, uh, probe that was telling you the total gas pressure in the water and so on. So you were just missing that sensor in the water. That I would say was a, a design fall or a sensor problem or whatever there have been at those issues. Others like uh, the hydrosulfide problems, you can say, have more be pointed at management, you can say, because you have to take care of maintenance, you have to remove the sludge, you have to do like that. Uh, we have a lot of customers who ask us if you can't do a sensor for hydrosulfide, but we think, why? Then we'll just tell you why your fish died. Uh, you should have been avoiding that problem way before that we get to that, uh, you can say. So I think the systems are there and the system they are uh, developing, you say, there's like a lot of new great thing coming out the next coming years, you can say, uh, especially with all this IA and so on we're putting into the systems. But you probably must have the sensors you need, you can say. But of course, it's something will maintain it. Do you also take the cost and put it in? Because it costs something. When, uh, when we talk and uh, Bjarne comes and say, this cost you 100 millions and uh, you and the concrete was more expensive and the building was more expensive and so on. The last thing you put in is your navigation system. And then you said to say, oh, well, let's save a little bit here, save a little bit here. But that's the most important, in fact, in the farm, uh, you can say. So it's, it's really a uh, part of it is not making TikTok videos and actually monitoring your app to make sure you know if your fish are dying. So, um, all right, well, well, well now uh, I, I want to uh, bring in my colleague, Demi Corbin. She's a business reporter with IntraFish and she has been, uh, she has been uh, monitoring the questions. So you'll hear a disembodied voice, but uh, she is there. Demi, um, tell us what we've heard from, uh, from some of the audience questions. Sure. So we've got an overwhelming amount of questions, but for the sake of time, we'll just leave it to two or three questions. Um, so I have a question for you, Brian. Uh, you mentioned ESG uh, and obviously RAS Salmon has some environmental advantages, but how do you expect the industry to respond to questions related to animal welfare, especially when we're focusing on stocking densities and, and things like that? And what research do you think is needed on animal welfare in RAS? That's a great question. And we firmly um, believe in maintaining the highest level of uh, animal welfare uh, for our animals here and for, um, for the industry, for the projects we, we work with and our stakeholders. Um, to that end, our director of research is actually a, a aquatic animal veterinarian and epidemiologist. And, and he has along again on this control aqua project uh, with the folks at you know, FEMA in Norway developed um, 
uh, indicators and things you can monitor to main, to ensure that your fish are uh, have the highest uh, welfare. And that includes things like not maturing because um, you don't want a fish maturing when you know it's at the wrong time. That's a very stressful thing for a fish, but also things like um, things to monitor like fin quality and fin indexing and overall body condition um, and some of the environmental parameters. So with RAS, you can control the environment. That's the benefit, right? You can provide the environment specific to the fish, salmon, trout, sturgeon, burbot, whatever. And you can, I, you can optimize that so the fish is in a very good environment so that it maintains good welfare. I think when people um, throw rocks at RAS, they're throwing rocks at the density issue, right? And so um, I think that is something we need to pay attention to, that the, the fish um, are at higher densities than say in the net pens. But again, you have to think about the fish itself. Like uh, we raised char Arctic char for many years and I've worked with an Icelandic grower of Arctic char. And the reality is uh, the char seem um, to show the indicators of very good welfare, very high densities. They, they almost seem to like the higher densities, the 100 uh, kilos per cubic meter and higher. In the case of our salmon, we, we tried um, uh, raising them as, as high as we could based on our system. And they seem to be very happy in terms of the indicators that we can measure. So I think, uh, the, these ESG things are very important. Um, they uh, point to the sustainability of it. Um, but I think, you know, on the farm level, um, RAS allows you to keep a great environment, control that environment, monitor the fish welfare. The fish aren't at the bottom of a pen 20 meters deep that you can't see. Usually your tanks are well lit and you have full view of the fish. Thank you, Brian. Um, tipping off that, uh, we didn't really mention the consumer side that much. So, so looking at consumers, um, Eric in particular, uh, what trends do you see that might drive consumers to embrace RAS fish more? And should we expect any premium on, on the product? Well, I think in general, um, uh, what we're seeing in the US, and I think this depends on where you are in the world, and consumer preferences so this will be different for you know different areas of the world uh, there's clearly a growing trend of local food production uh, many places and I think this fits well into that uh, and also traceability element uh, when you see for example there are mislabeling issues and traceability issues in the US market um, this proposal basically gives you full traceability from egg to fish out the door in one location uh, it's a good and strong message so I think, you know, you have to segment the market, different consumer segments have different preferences uh, and so on. But we do see a clear trend where uh, origin of the product, certainly to some extent also ESG, uh, depending on where you are, uh, but also freshness uh, counts a lot in this whole equation. So all of these things come together and can create a, a fairly good, uh, you might say, uh, case for land-based projects if they're executed well with the good quality product coming out in the end. So I think that's worth uh, always looking at depending on the market you're in and what the preference is. As far as premium goes, uh, we don't really apply any land-based premium uh, as far as we're concerned. When you look at the US market, there's a fairly wide range of pricing uh, all the way from uh, nine dollars something up to about thirty dollars a pound for wild the best wild salmon products. So I think it comes down to this: producing a great quality product, uh, doing it sustainably, and then you have to defend a good price in the market in the end. I think that's what really this comes down to um, in the future. Sure. Um, so my last question, and that's for you, Bjarne. Uh, um, so it seems that some of those projects are, are not going to tender, but rather uh, a RAS supplier is, is chosen by coincidence. And if we look some years ago, we, we know that all smolt and post smolt in Norway were out for tender with, with five to six companies. So what are your thoughts on, on that? We'll still see, uh, let's say, three or four rest supplies every time we are offering or giving it a quotation, more or less. Uh, but of course, there are more and more looking into references and 
they also ask, can we call your old customers? How do they see you, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not such an easy way just to get a product. Uh, by all means, people know what they are looking for and what they should be aware of. So, um, but there are normally two or three, two or three companies that are within this business for grow out. Okay, great. Um, those are the questions for today, but thank you so much for the presentation and I'm going to hand it over to Drew. Thanks, Demi. I wish we had more time uh, to uh, throw a few more of these questions at the at the panelists, but I'm sure folks will track them down. So let's uh, let's just go around and give our final thoughts on uh, on land based salmon, where we are and, and where it uh, where it's headed. Um, Brian, um, we'll start with you. Okay. What's the biggest hurdle that the industry needs to overcome to really reach its full potential? Uh, a major success story. I think it's that simple. We need someone to show uh, that at this massive scale that the projects are going to uh, towards that they can um, succeed biologically and they can succeed economically and they can do it while maintaining all of the sustainability benefits. Great. Pa, what are, what's your view on that? Uh, I think it will be a great success too. Uh, there's uh, the potential is there, uh, the money is there. It will be a journey, and but we will make it. Bjorna, what's your view? What, what's the, the big hurdle that needs to be overcome for this to, to really truly be a success story? Yeah, but it is also that you both, Pa and, and Brian said that, that let's say, I, I do believe that I should say that because I'm a rash supplier, but I do believe that we have proof concept. But there, there are a few things that still. I mean, management of farm, uh, as I said before, skill staff is very very important, and you, there are still some learning by doing uh, the, the the fish handling and grading because and uh, uh, handling such a huge fish tank is not a net case, right? All these things you cannot read about in a book. This is learning by doing. So, uh, but end of the day, I, I, I do believe in rest grow out. And I also see, let's say in, uh, down the road, listen, we, for every feed, you, one kilo feed you give to the salmon, you, you create 300 gram dry matter. In the future, dry matter slots can be used for not only fertilizer, biogas, energy, whatever, but it, it's a resource also for phosphor, uh, to gain phosphor back. And so there are many, many other things down the road, but of course, if you do not earn money, on the salmon production, then forget the rest. But I do believe in this case. Carl Amo, your thoughts on the biggest hurdle that needs to be overcome? Of course, this is extremely capital intensive business. Uh, so you will need to see a lot of investment for, for the land based industry to really grow. So uh, I think for, as uh, Brian said, to, to have some success stories that the investors see that this is working and that this is profitable. And then you will see uh, a lot of more money invested into the sector and, and then the sector will really start growing uh, also in terms of production volumes and not only in PowerPoint presentations. Eric, same question to you, you have the last word. Well, I think I want a good comment. I think the key word in my mind is patience. Uh, it's very you know, tempting to run along fast as possible to get to market. Uh, you have to have respect for these development processes and what it involves. Uh, I think, you know, uh, anyone should go through the learning cur curve that Bjorn is talking about. Um, your risk goes up if you try jumping directly to big scale without having t done those stepping stones. Mm. So I think, you know, companies who do take that learning curve seriously and learn from it and show that they have proof of concept should be in a very, very good position to succeed in this market. And there will be some bumps in the way, but I think, you know, the, the companies with the right staff, the right experience, and I would also say a passion for fish welfare, that's important. Yeah. Your raw system does not take care of your fish, your people do. Uh, and that's what's so important, your values and attitudes towards what you're doing, both on the environmental side and the fish. That's what this is all about. So I, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but cautious that take it at the right pace. Gentlemen, thank you so much. It's an absolutely fantastic uh, topic. We love covering it at Intrafish. We love seeing this kind of innovation and growth and enthusiasm. Uh, quick little plug before we end. Uh, we just launched a monthly 
land-based salmon newsletter because honestly there's so much news coming out that we just had to bring it together so uh we'll let all the uh, attendees know about that and, and how to sign up for that um and with that uh thank you again so much to our sponsor oxygard international uh thanks to our co-organizer uh billand um it's been a fantastic discussion we'll look forward to continuing uh continuing to cover and continue the conversation on intrafish.com thank you all so much thank you thank you so much yeah see you